Welcome to the Golden Age of Cardboard podcast, where we remember a time when stacks of cards were held together with rubber bands and Mickey Mantles were put in bike spokes. We hope you will enjoy and reminisce as you come along with us as we tell stories about the baseball cards from the golden age of baseball. We will examine the state of the vintage baseball card market and talk to some of the greatest collectors in the hobby. You won't be hearing us talk about any chrome or shiny cards here. Now, to take you on this retrospective journey, here's your host, direct from the shallow end of the gene pool, my son, Mike Moynihan. Yo and hello everybody, Mike here. Welcome to another episode of the Golden Age of Cardboard Podcast. Yes, uh, I am excited that you're here. I'm excited to be here because we are getting towards the end of this kind of epic journey through all of the vintage Bowman sets. Tonight we are doing 1948 Bowman, which means next week will be 1951 Bowman, and then we'll be done. So hopefully, you know, I've been getting a lot of feedback that everybody's really enjoyed this, and I appreciate that. Um, any comments you want to leave down below about it, you know, please do that as we go along. Really, uh, yeah, this has been a fun, a fun deal. I've learned a lot, and again, talking to my friends about cards is never a bad thing to do, and that's what we get to do tonight because I get to bring on a, a guy that I'm super tight with, and it's funny because. Jake, who's my guest tonight, and I do not collect the same. In I collect graded. He collects raw, ungraded. And yet, we have a lot of common things that, that we enjoy together about this hobby. And that's the cool thing about this hobby is it brings people together. And, you know, <clears throat> no matter what you do, you can find common ground with just about everybody in the hobby some way, somehow. And Jake and I have a lot of common ground, but that's different. I'll let, I'll let him tell you that. Hey, Jake, welcome to the show. What's up, Golden Age of Cardboard listeners out there? <laughs> All three of them. I think there's three. We have three regular listeners. And that's yeah. about it. Your mom, my mom, and Ty. Exactly. Ty has to listen to every show just to make sure it meets the standards of Bench Clear Media. Just mm -hmm. kidding. Uh, we actually have uh, multiple thousands of listeners a week. And so I, I can't believe it, honestly. <laughs> It's it's pretty terrific. Yeah, I'm I'm one of them, man. So it's always a, a pleasure to come on the show and, and chat vintage with you, and sometimes debate our differences, which is which is fun. We have we have way less differences than we do similarities. Agreed. That's true. Yeah, That's I mean true. the reality is we both love old cardboard and uh, 1948 Bowman. Man, let me let me read the description of the set real quick from cardboard connection and then we'll get into it this may be one of our shorter episodes just because of the nature of the set but it'll make sense in a second i promise uh 1948 bowman baseball marks the first time the company made a set of cards for the sport the checklist might be small and the design plain but it's a landmark release for numerous reasons including several key rookie cards the set has just 48 cards 12 of which are short prints Top rookies in the set feature a trio of all-time greats, Stan Musial, Warren Spawn, and Yogi Berra. Other rookies in 48 include Red Sheendienst, Phil Rizzuto, Ralph Kiner, and Bobby Thompson. Measuring 2 and 1 16th inches by 2 and a half inches, cards are smaller than today's standard size. The photos are very plain, done in black and white. Players are shown with a largely boring waist-up shots that are tightly cropped and show little personality. There are a few exceptions, but not many. Backs are similar to what collectors found on Gaudi cards before World War II. The top of the, or the top has the card number, the player's name and a headline, vitals along with a short bio. The bottom of the cards have an ad for Blowney Bubble Gum. 1948 Bowman Baseball is an important set for the hobby and introduced a major manufacturer that helped usher in modern trading cards. The cards aren't nearly as attractive as, as Bowman sets made a short time later, but the set's significance 
is more as of a launching point for the brand and the key players. Uh, although popular cards don't generally sell as well as those from 4849 Leaf. Granted, the set has rookie cards of Jackie Robinson and Satchel Page, something Bowman doesn't. The color in Leaf is also considered to be more pleasing by a lot of collectors. So that is the short uh, description of the set, Jake. What about this set do you love and, and why do you gravitate towards it? So I'm, I'm a set builder by nature anyways. I build all the Bowman sets and most of the top sets, Gowdy sets, that kind of thing. But I know you guys recently did 1955 Bowman. And one of the things you talked about how that set grew on you, I think also applies to 48 Bowman of the 55 Bowman TVs, if you will, were indicative of the time. And while there were color cards before 1948 Bowman, I think is the one of the main issued sets uh, in the somewhat mainstream issues for it to be black and white. I think it's indicative of that time period. Um, the beginnings of Bowman itself um, were in black and white. And then, you know, they carried on to color in 49 and, and so on into the fifties. Um, but I just think it has a, a nostalgic feel and it's, has a similar effect on people that 55 Bowman does of either you love it or you hate it. Usually uh, the black and white cards. What do you think that's true, Mike? No, <clears throat> honestly, now that I think, I don't think you have to hate it. it. I don't love it, but I don't hate it. I'm, I'm probably pretty neutral. There are some really great cards that I like in this set. Well, I just, I feel like a lot of people, maybe not you in particular or myself, but I feel like a lot of people are like, ah, black and white, you know, I'm not, I don't really like them, you know, because they're black and white. I feel like that's a common thread. Yeah. I mean, that's a good point. But I think about 40, uh, pl 40 play ball versus 41 play ball. And I mm -hmm. actually prefer the 40 play balls to the 41 play balls. I do as well. Um, just because of the players that are in the 40 play ball that are not in the 41 play ball. And all the 41 play ball is, is colorized versions of the 40 play ball cards by and large. So mm -hmm. it feels like that wasn't much of anything other than colorization. But so I don't dislike black and white cards just in and of themselves. Do I wish they were colors? Sure. Um, but I do get what you're saying about it being the inception of Bowman and they had never done cards before. So, you know, how is it? How are they going to know what works, what doesn't work? I I see this hard to know. I wasn't in the Bowman, you know, strategy room when they were thinking up this set and how to do baseball cards for, with gum. But it right. feels like there's punch counter punch in the baseball card industry in the in these early days of companies trying to figure out what they want to be when they grow up. You have 48 Bowman come out. Mm -hmm. Then you have the leaf set comes out in 49, although there were copyrights of 48. So it was out there. This is what we're going to do. These are what our cards are going to look like in their color and their, you know, striking different pastels and all the different things. Then you have 49 Bowman as I think a, a counter punch to that, right? With right. the color. So, cause 48 leaf, 48, 49 leaf, 49 leaf would have been already kind of a known quantity. They, Bowman would have gotten wind of it, probably looked at the the copyrighted images and going, oh, crap, we need to do something different or we're going to fall behind Leaf here. Then you see Leaf only one year wonder, right? And then so 50, 51, 52 Bowman are all relatively similar, right? Mm -hmm. And then 53 Bowman color, I think, is a response to 52 tops. Agreed. Tops comes out. and it, So I, I think it, this whole early age of cards post-war is a fascinating time. And I wish I could have been a fly on the wall as each of these companies were trying to figure out how to outdo each other. Because, mm -hmm. I mean, you're, you're right. I mean, it really was punch counter punch because once color was done by one of the competitors in this post-war era, they didn't go back to black and white you know, yeah, outside right. of 53 Bowman black and white. And there are different reasons and speculation on that. But as the entire set, as intended from the beginning, black and white was not done again. 
Yeah, that's an interesting point. Uh, I hadn't thought about the the growth of the of the industry from a design standpoint. Wow. Okay, now we're never going. Can't do black and white anymore, obviously, because other people will do color, and we need to do color. When that's a good the, point. I think, I think this is the last set, mainstream set, where there were. Well, no, I'm going to have to correct myself. I was thinking that it was the last mainstream set without facsimile signatures or names on the front, but 53 Bowman Color doesn't have names on the front or facsimile signatures. But it may be the exception to that rule. <laughs> yeah, it's definitely a plain design. I mean, if it, mm -hmm. let's, let's just be honest. It's extremely rudimentary in terms of design. Um, but there are some cards that do stand out. And I think it's fascinating being such a small set there's still, what'd you say, 25 Hall of Famers in this set? Yeah, that's over I mean, 50%. That's <laughs> right, right. So they did get, you know, a lot of the star players of the of the era, right? And mm -hmm. remember, we're coming out of World War II. Um, baseball is about to just absolutely explode once we get it was already incredibly popular pre-war mm -hmm. but now we're about to usher in an era of integration an era of incredibly good players and teams and legends and just things that made the sport what it is today you know turned it into america's pastime really uh mm -hmm. from a multi-generational you've got all these guys coming back from the war, having kids, you know, through the fifties and sixties and uh, baseball just explodes. Uh, so it's just, Hey, look, it is what it is. Right. I don't, I, again, I don't hate it. I just. Wait, I'm going to steal your, you know, title of your show, but it ushers in the golden age of cardboard. I it mean, does. it's, it's what it does. Yeah. Um, and it's, it's Bowman's first foray into baseball cards. So, you know, maybe that's why the set was so small, um, but it packs a punch, like you're saying. I mean, turns out 25 of the 48 cards are Hall of Famers, and of those 25, seven of them are Hall of Fame rookie cards. I mean, you know, it's proportionally, but percentage-wise, that's almost 20% of the set is a Hall of Fame rookie. Like, yeah. that's, a, that's a lot. Um, it is. Looking at it from that perspective. I mean, in, from that stance, Bowman did a lot right. Yeah. Well, we'll get into what I think they missed the boat on with this set in a little while. Let's talk about what they did do right. Because, uh, like you said, Hall of Fame rookie cards. Now, I only have five 48 Bowman cards in my collection. Uh, I, there are others that I want to add. I, I would love to get all of the rookies that are Hall of Fame rookies in this set, ultimately, over time. They're actually more expensive than you would think, given the general disdain for the design. Uh, it surprises me how expensive they are. But, uh, you know, let's start with one good one. I, I love this card. Uh, it's the 48 Bowman Phil Rizzuto. And if you're listening on podcast, this is one of those cards that you kind of look at it and you almost have to chuckle a little <laughs> bit because you're like, what is Rizzuto doing? I mean, the photographer caught him at a point where his jersey is, you know, looks like he's wearing catcher's gear underneath his jersey or something uh, because it's just like an interesting shot that they chose to use for Phil Rizzuto. And that's, uh, that's, that's a short print too. Is it? Yeah. So I assume the short prints were just, they didn't print it. I mean, that's, that sounds so dumb. Of course, a short print means they didn't print as many. So, breaking news here on Golden Age of Cardboard. Uh, short print means that uh, they were short printed and there were less of them. Yes. Get, get all your card information here. Man, I'm telling you, we are <laughs> really informing our audience tonight. But it just makes me wonder. I mean, he, he's card number... Let's see, eight. So that would have been on the first sheet. So why, you know, I don't understand. I guess I don't understand why they would have had short prints. Yeah. And I mean, I mean, you read from the cardboard connection, which to touch on that for a second, I love that you read from that, um, especially from a, a set building perspective. 
I think you should do your research on your set before you like jump, you know, all in. It's good to know what you're getting into value wise, how many cards there are, short prints are, all that good stuff. But speaking to this point, you know, it doesn't really give you anything to go on there of why there may be some short prints. Um, we'll have to phone a friend and call Dave. I mean, I, I don't know. Yeah. Um, but it, I mean, it is a popular set still. And the Rizzuto is great. Uh, I think we both have this card. Ralph Kiner has a rookie card in that set. Yeah. So here's the Kiner. And these are also cards that because they're black and white, I think that they they age well, if that makes any sense. Mm -hmm. They, even in lower condition, what we might call lower condition, they, the cards can still look good. I don't see these with huge centering problems most of the time. That's usually not an issue. Uh, you've definitely got corners you're going to deal with, increases and stuff like that. Because let's think about it. A lot of these kids being born and people... They hadn't collected cards before, so they didn't, mm -hmm. you know, how do you take care of these things? What do you do with them? All that kind of stuff. And so the the cards, though, even if they're in rough condition, I mean, you can get threes and all mine are threes, fours. All mine are raw. Right. But what would you say your average condition is? Kind of that same level? Ones, twos. Okay. Um, but I, I think you're right. I mean, the... Uh, Dylan Double D Vintage mentioned it on a preview episode about how the smaller cards can hide some imperfections better. I would also say that black and white cards probably hide a, a few more imperfections. I mean, you think about a, a crease that may break the paper. You know, it usually shows up white on a colored card, right? Right. These are black and white already. You know, mm -hmm. I don't think that's going to be as much of an eyesore. Yeah, that's an interesting point. Um, I, I think they look look good they don't tone like you'll see in 40 play ball there's a lot of cards that tone really bad probably from either the printing process or the cardboard that they use these typically are you don't you don't see a ton of toning issues with these mm -hmm. there's not a lot of gum stains from what i can tell from things that i've looked at but you got risotto kiner there's a it's a yankee is that hank bauer it's Ali Reynolds, and the reason Allie. I'm showing it, um, because you probably don't have any creased ones, Mike. I don't. Um, this card is is creased. Um, if you're watching on YouTube, uh, down there in the background to the uh, right of Reynolds, over his gloved shoulder, uh, that's a crease there. But it's I feel like it's not as much of an eyesore because the card is black and white. Yeah, that's a. Great point. It does hide a lot of stuff. Um, three of the bigger cards that they mentioned, I do happen to have. Uh, let's talk about the Spawn card first, because I think everybody that's listening to this, if you've seen this card, you can picture it in your head. Uh, yeah, they've got dueling Spawn cards there. Uh, mine's in a three. Definitely a little bit off center, but again, the backs are so simple. The spawn cards is great. You got this profile picture of him with that <laughs> infamous nose. You know, you, you immediately are drawn to, man, he's got a big schnoz, you know, kind of thing. Uh, but it, that's his rookie card, right? Yep. Warren Spawn's rookie card. And that's a very highly sought after card. I've got the Yogi Berra here. I don't have that one. That's a great card. I bought this a long time ago because it's part of the, the Rizzuto. I think the Spawn and the Bear are all part of the 300 Great Cards uh, set registry by Mike Payne. And, you know, again, not the greatest looking card, not the best Bear card by any stretch, but it is his rookie. Mm -hmm. And it, it's a very expensive card in mid or upper grades. Uh, it's, I mean, he's a Yankee great. So, that's what drives the price on that. Um, and then to me, the the best card in the set is the Stan Musial rookie. I absolutely, I actually love this card. There you go. I do too. Dueling uh, Musials, and I've got to give a shout out on mine. I always try to when I show it, but 
I won mine through a uh, contest here on YouTube from uh, Scott over at Scotty Tradition. Nice. Uh, that was a good decision several years ago. Yeah. Yeah, it, his portrait is great. It is incredibly simplistic, but it just shows musual, a young musual, you know, mm -hmm. just, I, I think it's a great card. I, I absolutely love it. Uh, when you think about cards of players that have, you know, cards in this set versus the leaf cards, their, their corresponding leaf cards, there's not a lot of overlap. There's a, you know, mutual has a card in both. Mm -hmm. um, Barra does not have a 49 leaf. No. Rizzuto spawn, does. So does Spawn. Spawn has a good, so does Kiner actually, now that mm -hmm. I think about it. I does think. Mize? Does Mize, Mize have a does leaf? too. Yeah. yeah. I think so. Uh, but this is an era that I just, you know, haven't dipped, dove head first into. I know you're working on the set. How long have you been working on the set? Uh, I don't know. Five, five, six years out of my like 45 sets that I'm doing at the same time. Um, so it's not a, it's not a main focus, um, but I am 23 of the 48 cards into it. So, I mean, right at 50%. Um, not quite you, one more card for 50%. One more card, one more card. Uh, but I mean, it if you get past a couple of the key cards, like if you get the Barra, if you get the Musial and, and the Spawn, I mean, it's a very attainable set to do a vintage set. So, is it a set you would tell people, hey, good one to start with because you don't have any like crazy expensive cards in it? I mean, the Musial is the most expensive card in the set, and you know, if you're going to buy it in a reasonable grade, you're going to pay well over a thousand dollars, but mm -hmm. it's not, you know, that's it. That's kind of the only card that really commands that kind of money. The bear is close, right? Mm -hmm. Probably 800 to a grand for a decent, uh, you know, four or five kind of grade. Uh, but it's overall, I think you're right. I think the cost of entry and time to complete is probably not, that big of a hurdle to overcome. No. And with, with the set having such a high percentage of hall of famers, you know, I would, I would encourage someone to anytime you build any hall of fame or any set. I mean, I believe that the best approach is to go after the best hall of famers that you can within your price range um, for that set. And if you decide to abandon the set at some point, um, or if you're in it for the long haul, you're better off going after the Hall of Famers first because if you decide to abandon it, well, you got Hall of Famers. You can't go wrong with that. Um, if you are doing it for the long haul and it takes you a while, well, which cards are most likely to increase in value first? The Commons or the Hall of Famers? The Hall of Famers. Um, so you want to get those while you can before they're out of your respective budget. And for 48 Bowman specifically, I mean, if you went after all Hall of Famers first, You'd have over half the set once you got them. So not a bad place to start. How'd you get so card wise at such a young age, Jake? Uh, you know, the Bible says to listen to other people's counsel and you will be wise. <laughs> so that's what I did. There you go. Uh, so true. We've all learned from others to get where we are. None of us, you know, we're born with any of this information. So we've all had to learn it. Uh, I wish I had more cards to show off, quite frankly. I just don't. But let's talk for a minute about, man, where did Bowman really miss the mark in terms mainly of players they could have and should have included, or should have maybe is a, the wrong word, but certainly uh, wish is probably the right word. Wish we, we would look back now and, man, if it this set had, who would you list off as players you wish it had? Jackie. I mean, right. got to have Jackie. Um, I mean, think about how amazing or how differently this set would be thought of if there was a Jackie Robinson in it. Completely different. I mean, I he, he's one of the the most collectible players in our sport of baseball. I mean, it totally changed the perspective. You're right. I mean, and he only has a handful of playing days cards. So adding one more to 48 Bowman, I mean, it'd be a huge card. And it would then it would automatically become his earliest card, you know. Again, I prescribe to Bone uh, Forty Nine Leaf as being a, a Forty Nine issue, 
despite Agreed. the copyright. But it uh, that would have been his earliest card. And yep. man, that would have been a huge card in this hobby. It would it would become the I don't want I don't know if I want to say this. Dave's gonna come after me. It would be the mainstream undisputed rookie card. I'll put it that way. For sure. Yeah, no question. And it would be one of the iconic cards in the hobby, like up mm -hmm. there with 52 tops mantle, 51 Bowman May. I mean, it would be an iconic card. I, mm -hmm. I can use that word with that card if it existed. I wish it also had, I mean, you're missing DiMaggio. You're missing Ted Williams, right? These are mm -hmm. huge stars at the time. Obviously, there was, you know, something to do with the money aspect of it, the contract, the players not really, right. eh, cards aren't are really cards a thing. You know, they may have been, you know, back in the 1910s, 1930s even, but, you know, there they're just aren't cards of those guys in this set, and I wish there were. Uh, I'm trying to think of some other big stars that aren't in the set that would be. Well, one that I think would be interesting if you know your Hall of Fame rookie card history around this era um, I know you know this, Mike, but the uh, the 49 leaf Hal Newhauser, right? Yeah. Super duper, super short print. And most recognize it as his rookie card, but it's virtually impossible to find. Right. Congrats to Chris from Missouri for getting one. Um, but what if he had a 48 Bowman and it was more common, less scarce? than the 49 leaf counterpart it would you know predate it by a year it would be considered his rookie and it would be more widely available it makes you wonder you know what the values of that card would be and how it would be treated in the hobby that, that's one that i think of sure um I, I just thought of somebody and i'm totally blanking now oh Pee Wee reese doesn't have a card in there oh no you know um it's just no, no. Oh, gosh. Satchel Page. Yeah, no Satch. I mean, think if there was a Satch in this in this set. He was playing in 48 for the Indians, right? So, yeah, I mean, that'd be the they, same thing with the Jackie, man. Right. I mean, if you had <laughs> this is true, should have, would have, could have. Right. But if, mm -hmm. if it had DiMaggio, Williams, Jackie and Page, I think the perspective on this set would be very different it would probably be treated more like 49 leaf is treated now at, right outside the short print component yeah yeah interesting i guess since dimaggio and williams and jackie are all in the 48 49 leaf i wonder if they had them under contract and they couldn't do the 48 bowman you gotta wonder uh, you know that's that's a very widely discussed topic regarding Bowman and tops, but that could have been the issue between leaf and Bowman at the time. I, if, if link leaf had already inked these guys to a deal sometime in 48 mm -hmm. in, in anticipation and preparation for releasing their set ultimately in 1949, but certainly it started in the process started in 48, no doubt. Mm -hmm. Right. And yeah, I don't know. Good speculation. Who knows? Right. But I wish we had just more insight into the history of that. The mystery. I don't I, I'd rather like the truth more than the mystery of wondering what happened. Right. Right. When it's 48 Bowman's, you know, the first quote unquote mainstream set since 1938. Gal night. Well, 1941 play ball. Excuse me. It's the first one, you know, post-war. And we've talked about all the Hall of Fame rookies and the opportunities that were missed. But there was a couple other ones I wanted to touch on that are notable to baseball history that have rookie rookies in 48 Bowman. Um, there's Marty Marion, who won an MVP. MVP, yeah. His rookie card's in it. Hank Sauer's rookie card is in it. Also an MVP. And Bobby Thompson, shot heard around the world, his rookie card. Um, and for a Braves fan like me, Johnny Sane's rookie card is in it, you know. Not a superstar, but a notable player. Spawn insane and pray for rain. That's right. So, I mean, there, there's some nice uh, little semi-star cards in there as well. Yeah, I, I just like the idea that it, that it's so small that it's that it's doable. 
Mm. You know, you get into some of the higher card number sets, even some of the Bowman sets, it, it gets, it can get overwhelming quickly. Mm-hmm. And I, I'm a big believer. Like I build sets too. Okay. Or I've started to do that more and more. And Proud you know, of you, Mike. I know. And cause they're all mainly raw except for the hall of famers. But the biggest thing that bothers me about building sets is spending any amount of money really, but kind of crazy money on common players just bothers me. And I don't know why Uh, the fact that half of this set over half this set is hall of famers. Okay. I could, you know, I'm not buying as many common players. And then if you include the stars, like you mentioned, now you're getting into three quarters of the set or so. Mm -hmm. Right. So if you can buy a set, if you can build a set where three quarters of the players are known to be like have a known baseball legacy of some degree, that's, that's powerful. And if you take it a a step further, you know, uh, I keep touching on all these YouTubers, but Alex Bowman 53, now that he's finished his set, you know, he's gone off in this realm where he's kind of collecting the 50s of the, you know, center of the universe in the baseball world during that era, which were the the Yankees, Giants, and Dodgers, who were all in New York. Well, if you take it this set a step further and you collect just cards from those three teams, I mean, now you're talking almost the entire set. Um, because, you know, a lot of the, the star players – or semi-stars of the day, like I think of Larry Jansen, pitcher on the Giants, his rookie cards in this set. You know, Joe Page, pitcher for the Yankees, his short print rookie card is in this set. Um, <laughs> if you just want a, a snapshot of the of the 50s right before they happen, this is a good set for that. Yeah. Great point. I, I do feel bad. I feel like we're I feel like I'm not doing as enthusiastic of a job describing the set and talking about it. And it's probably because it, it's mirroring my enthusiasm for the set period. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, again, I don't hate it, but I feel like I'm not giving it as much excitement and, you know, uh, building it up, propping it up, talking it up. Like I do the other car or the other sets that we've talked about in this series. But and the reason I waited so long to do this one is because I was kind of dreading doing it. Honestly, I'm looking forward the most to the next set because I think it's the 51 Bowman so underrated, so pivotal uh, in the hobby, and such a great set. And that's why I wanted to do it last. And so this one just kind of got pushed around a little bit. Okay, let's do it. I'll get Jake. I know he's collecting that set. So uh, he'll be able to talk about it. Cause most people, when I ask them, they're like, yeah, I don't really do 48 Bowman. Honestly, that's, that's kind of the response I get from people. Well, well let's for your listeners, let's, let's bridge the gap here. You know, what do you think that 48 Bowman lacks that maybe 51 Bowman has going for it that you think 48 Bowman could have done better? Because obviously you like 51 Bowman. You just, you know, sung its praises. Right. Don't love 48 Bowman. So what what's the difference between the two that makes that the case? Well, 51 Bowman has two of the key rookie cards in the hobby, Mantle and Mays. Absolutely. Right? Now, you could argue, argue Musial was every bit of the player Mantle and Mays were. Um, most people from the St. Louis area will certainly agree with that. Mm-hmm. Uh, Barra, you know, inner circle hall of famer Barra, right? So spawn one of the 300 game winner, man, uh, way more than that, right? 373 or whatever he won. Mm-hmm. Uh, great. One of the greatest left-handed pitchers ever top three greatest mm-hmm. left-handed pitchers ever. Uh, I'm trying to think who I would put Carlton, Lefty Grove, and then Spawn. I'm a little biased, but I say Spawn. Okay. Uh, Lefty Grove was pretty insane. He was awesome. Actually. Uh, and then Koufax is there in the discussion, but he his peak was so short that, you know, was 
Kofax great and on a whole nother level of awesome, no doubt. Um, but it's hard to put somebody that only had really six good years in in the same conversation with Carlton, Spawn, Lefty Grove, those types of players. That's mm -hmm. hard for me because um, longevity does matter. I completely uh, agree. But, yeah, I mean, I'm looking at the checklist right now, and you're right. It's very New York heavy <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, as I'm looking at the set. Uh, when did – Let's see. Jackie started in 47. Mm -hmm. Campanella didn't start till 49, right? Yeah, I think that's right. Because if if Campy played in 48, because Campanella's rookie card's obviously uh, 49 Bowman, but let's see. His first year with Brooklyn. 48. 48. Played in 83 games in 48. Yeah, so that's not hard to understand why he doesn't have a 48 Bowman. In theory, he could, but uh, they weren't that savvy. Yeah, exactly. Uh, so, yeah. Um, what else do you want to say about this set? I knew this was going to be one of my shorter episodes, and that's okay about this series because it's a small set, not a lot to talk about. Well, what else separates 51 Bowman from 48? I mean, the two iconic rookie cards, yeah. I mean, that's hard to compete with, with Mantle and Mays. But what else makes you love that set? It can't be those two cards alone. Uh, color. The players that are included. I mean, you do have Ted Williams in the set. You're missing Jackie in that set, which mm -hmm. is, again, kind of weird uh, that he was in 50 Bowman. And then that's the last Bowman card he has. He has 49 and 50 Bowmans, and then that's it. And then he doesn't appear on a Topps card until 52. So why the gap? You know, that's something that's missing. But, uh, guy, wait till I talk about 51. But, I mean, I have so many great cards. The Spawn card is great. The Rizzuto card is great. The I mean, the images are way more interesting in the 51 Bowman. There's still some boring ones, but. Uh, you've got some just, I don't know, it's just a better looking set to me. There's a lot of headshot photos in 48 Bowman. Yeah. Yeah, pretty much everything's pretty much from the waist up, right? Yeah. There's there's very few, even with players like swinging a bat. There are a few. Yeah, Barra um, swinging a bat. Right. Uh, Kiner swinging a bat. Mm -hmm. but it's It's like... You know, a, a shot they took, you know, during batting practice or something sitting there right on the field. Um, yeah, I just, I wish I could be more excited about it. I'm just pretty Switzerland on the whole thing. I like the cards that I have, and there are more that I want to get. Mm -hmm. But I'm not just going, oh, my gosh, I've got to have these pivotal cards in the in the hobby. I, I do I think, have the ones. I think there are for any complete vintage collection, there are cards in this set that everyone should have. Okay. Um, the Spawn, the Musial, the Barra. However, that being said, I don't think it's ever going to be one of the most popular sets. It's not going to be one that, you know, people sing its praises on every, in every corner of the internet. It's just not going to happen. Um, there's just, there's too much competition. There's too many beautiful sets out there. Um, but I think it's an important stepping stone uh, for the history of Bowman and for the history of baseball cards that does get overlooked a little bit. Yeah. I mean, that, that's a fair point about how important it is. Groundbreaking almost, right? Okay, we're going to start releasing cards again post-war. So I, I get the weight that that carries – but I, I think the interest in this set is so narrow in terms of the key cards uh, that it'll just never be widely popular in the hobby. If we talk about, since we're kind of getting into it, kind of the future of this set in the hobby, that's actually a, what, how I should have ended every episode is what's the future for this set in the hobby? And I think of all the Bowman sets, this has the least exciting future if you were to think about collectors being jazzed about this set in 20 years it's probably going to be the same or less than it is today mm. yeah i think the 
the key cards will continue to kind of do their slow burn grow. Right. You know, they just, cause they are what they are, but you take the usual, for example, you know, the 49 leaf people are like, Oh my gosh, the 49 leaf musual. It's so great. I gotta have it. I gotta add it to my collection. It's not even his rookie card. Right. You know, where the 48 Bowman is, but it just doesn't have that like, bam, in your face. This is a beautiful card um, that has more wide range appeal outside of, you know, the set builder, the Hall of Fame rookie card collector. It, it has more mass appeal because it's a beautiful card. Yeah, so I agree. I, I think the future of it, I'm with you. Probably pretty similar to what it is now would be my guess. Yeah. Which, yeah. all right, I'll ask you this question. Which Bowman set do you think has the best future in terms of potentially rising popularity? People realizing, man, this is really great. Hmm. Is there one? <laughs> I, I love early 50s Bowman's Bowman cards. Um, What's your favorite of the seven years? <laughs> That's another tough question. Um, probably 52 Bowman. Okay. Um, now I'm a little biased, uh, because I have completed it. That does have a little bit to do with it. Um, it'll be the oldest mantle I probably ever own. Um, but I say 52 Bowman because it has an alternative in the year 1952 for Mickey Mantle. Same thing for Willie Mays, because their tops counterparts are worth way more money. Right. Uh, and it is essentially a copycat set of 51 Bowman, but they tend to be less expensive. So I think it has more room to grow as, as the 51s, which I think are arguably the most popular outside of 53 Bowman color, continue to grow in value. 52 is a good alternative to get a lot of early Bowman Hall of Fame cards that have beautiful artwork that kind of define 50, 51, and 52. Um, they're all kind of similar. Uh, that'll be within reach more of collectors longer. Pondering that question myself, I would say the, the one set that has the biggest opportunity to grow in popularity is 53 Bowman Color. As popular as it is now, I think over time that set will, I think, be even more appreciated by people. Uh, and I would put second, I would put 55 Bowman. That was my second. That, that would be my second is 55 because I think it, that, like me, vintage collectors, that set grows on you. And that's a common thing. I, that's not just me. That's something I hear a lot. Oh, I used to not like 55 Bowman at all. And now I love them, you know, kind of thing. Uh, and that's how I feel about the 48. If if I had, you know, the cards I have, I love. So I don't want it to sound like I'm just poo-pooing all over 48 Bowman. Uh, I just, it's not my favorite, right? Mm -hmm. And that's well, okay. It's, it's one of those things where, like, once you start building the set of any set, and you get more and more of them in hand and you get close to completion or once you complete it in terms of this set, you know, once I complete 48 Bowman, is it going to be a favorite of mine over 56 tops over 54 tops? No, absolutely not. <laughs> but it will still be special from the standpoint of, wow, I completed the first year of Bowman cards. Like that's an important part of the history of the hobby and of baseball. Yeah. Um, that's why I collect anyways, you know, building a museum to the history of the game. Uh, and I think 48 Bowman's a part of that, whether people love it or not. <laughs> I, I great way to end. Cause I think that's a, a great point. People should remember. And, you know, if you hate it, maybe find a few cards that you like, you know, I bet, I bet there are a few cards that you like, even if you don't just, love the overall design so jake man thanks for coming on and and talking through this with me yeah man you're welcome next time i'll get on for something that you really love right 
See, that makes me just sound like such a <laughs> negative Nancy over here. Uh, no, of course you'll be on again. Anyway, I'll have you on again for sure. This is, you've made multiple appearances on the show and I appreciate it as always. Uh, I know you got a young family and time is important. So the fact that you gave some to the listeners of our, my podcast, I appreciate that. Yeah, man. Happy to do it. I enjoy it anytime. Uh, and, and thanks for having me on. And if everybody's still listening, thank you for listening. All right, guys, we all have a good one. We'll be back next week, as you heard, with 1951 Bowman. Looking forward to that. Y'all have a great one. Keep collecting.